from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. We still have a lot to learn and a lot to improve. So I'm going to say this is a call to action. And if you have suggestions on how we can improve the library's visitor experience for everyone, please contact Travis <laughs> <laughs> and all of us. He is our official person that makes sure that accessibility stays in the forefront of all of our planning and all of our experiences. Thank you, Travis. Now, I want to introduce our amazing lineup of speakers we have with us today, and these are people who are making it happen. Congressman Representative Kevin Yoder and Congressman Mark Takano are the co-chairs of the Congressional Deaf Caucus, and we appreciate their time and are honored to have them here with us this afternoon. And then the esteemed president of Gallaudet University, Ms. Bobby Cordano, who will present to us information about the state of deaf education and the impact that ADA has had on her life. And then she will be followed by TEDx presenter August Shatama on his passion for books and what they have meant for his life. I know you will enjoy the presentations and I just want to thank you for being part of this event and helping all of us make sure that we provide access for everyone. So remember, we can clap like this. <laughs> Travis? Well, good afternoon. It's my honor to join this esteemed panel uh, and others to help celebrate the 27th anniversary of the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And I appreciate Dr. Hayden's uh, opening remarks and her allowing us to have this event in this beautiful historic facility that she maintains uh, for uh, Americans to continue to enjoy and to celebrate many historic events. And today is one of those chapters in the great legacy uh, of our country. Um, I want to thank all of you for your commitment to working for disabled Americans, especially those in the deaf community, in Congress, in Gallaudet, uh, and the rest of academia, in the private sector. I'm proud to join all of you in celebrating the Americans with Disabilities Act today. As we know, our nation was founded on the principle that all people, men, women, are created equal. The ADA is a landmark piece of legislation that embodied that principle with its impact making ripple effects throughout our nation still today, benefiting countless disabled Americans. It has helped up, open up doors, both literally and figuratively, to employment and services for many people with disabilities and ensured that those with disabilities are afforded equal access to government services and public accommodations. It's hard to think of a, our country without the ADA. It's hard to think of America before that period and why that was ever the case. Uh, the ADA helped implement, for example, in the deaf community, telecommunications relay services, making sure the deaf and hard of hearing can have full access to telephone networks. These reforms were important steps towards making sure that no one in America gets left behind and everyone has equal opportunities. Now, I'm a Kansan, and Kansas has a very special role in history when it comes to the ADA. Uh, that connection continues today with the legacy left by a great statesman known as Senator Bob Dole, who just recently had his 94th birthday, by the way. He was and still is one of the biggest advocates for the disability community, inspiring myself and others to continue to carry the baton and his legacy forward. He had such a special personal story uh, because as someone with a disability stemming from inju injuries sustained in combat during World War II, he was able to use his perspective to help fight for others, to help fight for all of us. He was instrumental in the passage of the ADA, and he viewed it as one of his proudest moments. And, when, and long after Senator Dole and others, we've all passed in politics, his legacy, the ADA, will pass on from generation to generation. 
he had a lot of proud moments. He did a lot of things, but saying it was one of his proudest says a lot, considering his career. So his legacy is an inspiration to me and many of our fellow Kansans. Uh, in my service in Congress, uh, I represent the Kansas School for the Deaf in Olathe, Kansas. And I've had a great opportunity to work with many of the students and teachers and community members uh, who make up uh, my constituents and who are a very important part of our community. And so uh, what Senator Dole laid forward is what I'm working to fight for, to fight for disability rights. And I think the Senator would agree that there is still more to be done. The difficult reality is that in spite of the progress made through the ADA, around 7 in 10 deaf people in the U.S. are unemployed or underemployed. We have a lot of work to do. This means that there are 33 million deaf people who can't make enough money to support themselves. This is just one symptom that shows our work is not done, and there are clearly still barriers between deaf people and quality jobs and full involvement in society. We've attempted to partner with uh, many employers throughout the country to help them build uh, opportunities for employment. Uh, just a few months ago, there was an event we had at the Kansas School for the Death with, with Uber, and they were showing that they have um, specific programs set up to help uh, the deaf community become Uber drivers, for example. Um, so technology is also helping us solve this problem along with uh, government policy. But in recognition of the need to keep advocating for the deaf community, uh, that was what led uh, Congressman Takano, my good friend from California, uh, and I to help form and, and build the Congressional Deaf Caucus. We've been joined by 18 other members of Congress who are all dedicated to advocating on behalf of Deaf Americans. The Congressional Deaf Caucus recognized that the, the ADA was not the finish line in disability rights, but rather one step as part of an effort that needs to continue. Now, I also have another role uh, in that when I was first came to Congress, I was honored to be appointed by the Speaker of the House to the Gallaudet Board of Trustees. And I am a proud Kansas Jayhawk. Don't get me wrong. I'm not switching allegiances. But I'm also a proud Gallaudet Bison. And uh, we're very proud of the university here in Washington, DC. And it's helped me create a connection between the Kansas School for the Deaf, as folks graduate high school, and helping them understand the value of Gallaudet University, uh, as well as my colleagues who, in Congress, may not know uh, what Gallaudet University is uh, doing and its powerful legacy. Uh, here in Washington. It's the only university in the world specifically designed for deaf and hard of hearing students, and I'm glad to be part of this unique and vital institution. It has been a privilege to serve the university and learn more about the deaf community and the issues it faces. And President Cordano is leading uh, an outstanding school, and I'm working to make sure that Gallaudet has the resources it needs. <laughs> All right, there we go. And I'm working to make sure that the Gallaudet has the resources it needs to continue educating deaf students. Uh, and we were just discussing uh, that uh, most recently the Appropriations Committee approved a bill that included a $6.7 million increase for Gallaudet University in the coming year. And these very divided times we live in, right, it's hard to turn on the news without wanting to throw your TV out the window. Uh, people are angry at one another. Uh, Gallaudet University is a unifier in this Congress. And to see a bipartisan effort to increase support in a significant amount to me tells us there's still hope for civility, there's still hope for bipartisanship, uh, and uh, the issue of support for Gallaudet University is, is one of those great areas we can come together. And we know that those dollars, if we can eventually get it signed into law, will be served and utilized very well to help more students uh, fulfill <coughs> their dreams. So in conclusion, as we mark the 27th anniversary of the American with Disabilities Act, I hope we can, can both celebrate the accomplishments that have been made as well as roll up our sleeves to continue the work that still needs to be done. I want to say thank you to everyone here who has contributed to the fight for the rights of disabled Americans and for the deaf community in particular, and I am proud to join you in this effort as we work to preserve the legacy of the ADA. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Congressman Yoder, for your contributions and for coming today and updating us on a lot of the legislation that's pending and what there is more to do. So thank you so much. I would like to welcome the other co-chair of the Congressional Deaf Caucus, Representative Takano. Good afternoon and thank you. Uh, thank you for being here and thank you to the Library of Congress for inviting me. Uh, to this wonderful event, Dr. Hayden. Um, it's always wonderful 
uh, and a pleasure to see you. And I'm truly grateful uh, for the work that you do. And I promise to return all of the overdue books that I still owe to the library. <laughs> this week, we celebrate the 27th anniversary of the Americans with Disability Act, uh, which is a perfect time to reflect on the contributions made by so many deaf and hard of hearing Americans throughout American history. Uh, from serving in the Peace Corps, to working in the federal government, to becoming teachers, lawyers, and doctors, deaf Americans have contributed to the cultural and economic strength of this nation. And your influence is only growing. I personally look forward to the day that we see the first deaf person elected to Congress. And maybe it will be someone who is in this room today. Uh, my Riverside, California district is home to one of two California schools for the deaf. And that means I have the honor of representing a large and important deaf and hard of hearing population. When I came to Congress in 2013, I was shocked to see uh, that there was very little representation for the deaf community. I decided to do something about it, and I joined with Congressman Kevin Yoder from Kansas, who we just uh, heard from, to launch the Congressional Deaf Caucus. It is a bipartisan group of 25 members who are advocating for the deaf community, and new members are joining every year. The caucus is dedicated to bridging the communication divide between members of Congress and their deaf and hard of hearing constituents. And we focus on empowering deaf and hard of hearing individuals to engage uh, with their members of Congress because our country is built on the idea that every person deserves fair representation. So my office has taken the lead in expanding internship opportunities for deaf and hard of hearing individuals on Capitol Hill. To date, my office has hosted seven deaf interns from Gallaudet University. Thank you. Including Catherine. Catherine, would you raise your hand? Uh, and she's here with me today. And I can say with sincerity, and Catherine has just taught me to sign this, they have been amazing interns. Amazing interns. <laughs> I still remember got you that, but I don't know how to do the university parts. Like uh, these two here, half so circle. it's half circle like that. So, got you that? Half circle like that. Right. <laughs> go, go buffalo. Oh, is it uh, bison? Go bison. Um, <laughs> how do you do bison, Catherine? This, like this. Bison. That's bison. All right. Thank you. Um, building a strong coalition of advocates for deaf and hard of hearing individuals is critical to making progress on some key issues, including your right to serve your country. A few years ago, I introduced the Keith Nolan Air Force Demonstration Act, which would create a demonstration program in the Air Force for 15 to 20 deaf and hard of hearing individuals. It was named after a young man who has been fighting for the deaf community's ability to serve. Keith Nolan's life goal is to be a military officer. He enrolled in and completed the first two levels of Army ROTC at the UCLA Cal State Northridge program. But he was not allowed to continue due to the Department of Defense rules that exclude individuals who are deaf or hard of hearing. He excelled in the ROTC program. Keith is entirely capable of serving. The more people we have in Congress who will stand up for Keith and for others like him who want to serve, the better chance we will have of expanding opportunities for the deaf and hard of hearing community. Now, as I conclude my remarks today, I want to recognize some of the transformative work being done here in Washington, DC, but not in Congress. Now, Gallaudet University is just two miles from Capitol Hill, 
and it was founded during the Civil War through a congressional charter signed by President Lincoln to provide higher education to deaf people. It is the only liberal arts university in the world, in the world, that caters to deaf, hard of hearing, and deaf blind students. Not only does Gallaudet uh, provide a top-notch education for its students, um, it also conducts groundbreaking research on language acquisition and bilingual education. As an aside, I learned on a visit to the Riverside School for the Deaf that an 18-month-old child has a larger active vocabulary, um, a greater ability to communicate than a hearing child. There is so much the general public does not know or understand about deaf and hard of, the hard of hearing community, and we need to work together to change that. I want to take a moment to recognize a special guest uh, who's already been mentioned, but I want to just uh, give another shout out to her. Um, we have her here today, and, and she's going to speak in just a moment. I want to say, you know, my own, uh, my own praise, my own praises to Gallaudet President Roberta Cordano, who is the first deaf woman to lead the school in its 152-year history. What an amazing thing that is, President Cordano. You are a role model, not just for the deaf and hard of hearing community, but for every person who has ever been told that they can't do something because of who they are. It is an honor to be with all of you this afternoon. Thank you again for inviting me to participate. Thank you to the Library of Congress and Dr. Hayden for the work that you all do to ensure that our history is fully accessible to all Americans. My promise to you is that I will continue to work with Congressman Yoder, the Congressional Deaf Caucus, and all members of Congress to ensure that deaf and hard of hearing people have a place on Capitol Hill. Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we have uh, done an internship here at the library as well and tried to model it after Takano's, uh, Representative Takano's internship program. So we definitely thank him for that as well. Um, and now uh, everyone in their speech has so far mentioned President Cardano. Uh, so now it is an honor to uh, welcome her to the podium. possibilities for partnerships between Gallaudet and the Library of Congress. Secondly, as Representative Yoger, and many of you know, he is on the board of Gallaudet's trustees and a great supporter of the university. In terms of our federal appropriations that we receive yearly from Congress, we very much appreciate his support. We do have three public trustees on the board of uh, trustees at Gallaudet University. We have uh, Representative Butterfield, Senator Butterfield, and also, of course, uh, Representative Takano and Representative uh, Yoder. On the Senate side, uh, we have a senator from Ohio, which is Senator Brown, representing uh, that Congress representative on the board. So these folks are important allies to us in the deaf community as well. So I want to thank the three of you for your support of our community and for Gallaudet. I'm truly honored to be here as president of Gallaudet University in the Library of Congress. So the first question I have is how many of you have a Library of Congress reading card? Let me see a show of hands. It looks like three or four, maybe five, six of you. Seven, eight? Well, let me say, if you don't have a reading card, I strongly suggest you come. There's a building right across the street where you go in and you can sign up, get your picture taken. And you get one of these Library of Congress reading cards. So you can come into the reading room right here in the Library of Congress. And it's a wonderful way to spend an afternoon on a weekend or an early morning just to come and sit and research and do some reading. It's one of my favorite things to do here in DC. And I encourage you all to go over there and get one of those reading cards. It's probably the best thing you can get here in this city and then one of the best things to do. 
I do want to thank the Library of Congress for recognizing this 27th anniversary of the American <coughs> Disabilities Act. We're here today to celebrate that momentous <coughs> occasion, and also it's important for all of us to understand com some context and what's happened in the years since the passage of the ADA, the support that we've received, and our civil rights and freedom associated with that. This is first the 200th year of deaf education here in the United States. It was 200 years ago at the American School for the Deaf, of which, of course, there are pictures of here in this room, that deaf education began here in the United States. And it's important because it's the first time in history that a school was founded on this notion that visual language was very important in the instruction of deaf children. And this school for the deaf using American Sign Language to teach deaf children is a methodology that was first learned and then brought over from France. We have a 200 year history that we draw upon today. If it wasn't for that event 200 years ago that led to the founding of a number of schools for the deaf throughout the United States, those schools have since produced, as you all know, high school graduates. And it was the beginning of the makings of a middle class of deaf people here in America. The son of Thomas Gallaudet, who founded, of course, the American School for the Deaf, came to realize there were opportunities in providing deaf people opportunities to get a college education. And he worked at Thin, came to the D.C. area to found the Columbia School for the Deaf and for Deaf Mute. There was an elementary school here in the area. It was decided that they would begin a university, and with the help of Amos Kendall, went on to found and chartered through Congress, signed by Abraham Lincoln, the very first, and as was mentioned by Congressman Takano, the first and continues to be the only university in the world that provides direct instruction to deaf individuals through American Sign Language. You know, that experience continues to be the only one like it in the world. And that's what makes this day even more special and unique. It is for all of us a reminder of our need to continue to protect the language of our community. And that is the right that is protected by the ADA. To the ability to communicate through this language and to do so effectively. It's by no accident that Gallaudet was part of the passage of the ADA. If you remember, um, here in the halls of Congress, it was at that time the ADA was being discussed that DPN, Deaf President Now protest, began. Many of you in this room were probably part of the uh, DPN protest. Some of you were, I see here today. There's a part of a calumny alumni community that also supported the Deaf President Now. So there were seven what we call ducks who were alumni supporters of the Deaf President Now protest. So it was that protest that really woke up Congress and drew the attention on Gallaudet and deaf people's fight for civil rights and all that came with this, and then led to the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act, in a large part because of the file that was fu fueled as a result of Deaf President Now. Had it not been for DPN, I think everyone would tell you that the ADA would have never passed. But DPN provided the energy, the motivation, and the hope that people could see that deaf people and disabled people wanted to be able to be part of the civic life around them. And that hope was made possible through the ADA. And again, it represented the hope of the rights of people with disabilities to be able to participate fully in the civic life. The ADA is not just about access. <coughs> It's about the right to participate in community life. You know, we sometimes forget that language. It's about our right to be members of our community, to have access to learning, to employment, to be able to connect and participate in community activities and engagement and events, to be able to go to movie theaters, to be able to go to theat theatrical productions, all allowing for civic participation in community life here in this country. to go back to something here. As I've mentioned, you know, it's the 200 year anniversary of deaf education here in the United States. We're also celebrating something else. 
it's now, I believe, 58 years ago that American Sign Language was discovered to be a full language. That discovery was made at Gallaudet University. It was the first time in the history of the world that sign language was actually seen to be commensurate to any other language that was used, be it English, French, German, Spanish, that American Sign Language was given the same prestige and recognition. It was just 60 years ago that this was the verified, or rather 57 years ago, that this was verified to be the case. And that is significant in our understanding that American Sign Language is still in its infancy. ADA is 27 years old. American Sign Language is only 57 years old in terms of its recognition officially as a language. And if we go from there and understand that from that understanding that there is an official language, that there must be culture, or literature, or form of arts that's very unique and specific to a visual language, and that was as well proven to be true as we began to recognize books uh, created by deaf people and that spoke to uh, American deaf heritage, and that if you foster a language and an arts, then students came together to verify one other thing, and that is the fact that they have civil rights, that we have civil rights, and that civil right mindset has allowed us to participate in a movement that's far bigger than our own. Minority rights in a country like this has significant meaning, understanding that we may be a small community, but we're a part of a larger community, and how is it that we can get the representation that we need within that larger majority culture? And then, of course, those questions led to the Deaf President Now protest, and another protest which occurred in 2006, I looked at that protest as being a very significant one for different reasons than just being about the selection of a president. But it was instead a way for the community at Gallaudet to be able to express its right to self-determination and the rights to be able to be part of a process, to be engaged in a process. The right to be included in a process is what that protest wrestling recommended. It happened to be about the selection of a president, but it really was about the right to be in part of a process which creates self-determination and another part of being part of a free country and a democracy that allows us to be a part of that process and let us never forget that is the case. So all of this to say still leaves the question of language spoken language versus sign language. And that debate has been a long-standing one over the years, from Plato you know, to the 1880s, even to now. Mm -hmm. People really advocating for you know, the use of spoken language or the use of sign language. Research over the last 12 years at Gallaudet has really come to realize it's not an either-or proposition, and it never has been an either-or proposition. It's more of an and proposition. If you develop bilingual brain in a deaf child, that child's brain will thrive as a result. And if that child is able to produce spoken language, that's fine. They can pick up English. That's still available to them. They can read or write English if they can't speak English. But having access to a visual language as well creates a powerful opportunity for brain development. And that's just extraordinary. And so finally, we have science catching up to we, what we as a community has known all along. Science is now verifying the fact that we have been saying for a number of number of years, and that fact, of course, really is represented in the beauty of our university, how we can have an immersive experience for people of our community, that government in our country and have allowed people in our community to have this opportunity is significant because there's no other experience like it in the world. I want to shift a bit to talk about the ADA and our Constitution where it talks about the goal to create a more perfect union. The ADA to me is one of the first steps in that process in this country to create that more perfect union. And so I asked myself as I prepared to come here, what have we learned in the past 27 years? What have we learned? And one of the first things that comes to mind is that education and learning 
that is really honed in on the individual skills of that child and the unique approach that they bring to the world is critical to the success of every child in America. Whether that child has a disability, despite their skin color, their religious beliefs, their political affiliations, religious beliefs, all of those social constructs created by people to label, to separate, and take people from coming together united without paying attention to that person's unique way of being and what they uniquely bring to the world. That is very powerful. And why don't we teach to that strength, that uniqueness that they bring instead of to their weakness? When we teach to the child's weakness, their inability to hear, we take away from what we can give them when we instead teach to their ability to have that visual <coughs> language. And why not do both? Why not afford them both that opportunity to speak, have access to that language as well as sign language? And ADA is an invitation for us to engage in that kind of a conversation. Moving on to employment, that's the key to a strong country. Deaf people's success in the United States has been afforded by their access to employment opportunities. Many Gallaudet graduates go into the workforce, and strangely enough, in the last 10 to 15 years, our progress in the employment arena has not been as great as it had been before the passage of the ADA. And the question is raised as to why that is the case. What's the fundamental problem that we need to address in order to change that? Minnesota the federal, and the federal government in the past looked to the number of people with disabilities and saw that's over 20, 15 to 20, 30 percent of these individuals, never 30, but at least 15 to 20 percent of the population is disabled. After 2007, after the recession, the numbers began to drop off to 2 to 7% of the disability, disability community being employed. And this creates the future challenge for us. Our work is not done. We sit back and look to the wonder of ADA, and yes, certainly we do recognize that, but we also recognize the work that needs to be done and what we need to do in order to change and improve, improve our employment outcomes for all people with disabilities, not just deaf people. Learning and engagement in the community is our right. And that's a lesson that we learn from the ADA. We have the right to learn and be engaged in the community around us. And that's what leads to us being strong citizens. Engaged in the political process, in our communities, in our schools, in our family units, in our deaf organizations, and a variety of other places. Access. If we talk about access, it is public good. I mean, don't think it only being about you as an individual having access, but it is an overall public good and applies to every single one of us, our families, our friends, and our communities around us. Providing interpreters and captioning is not just advantageous for people who are deaf, it's advantageous for everyone in the room. It is about public good. And that kind of language needs to change. And that is the impact of the ADA. We must choose to broaden the understanding of the impact of the ADA. It provides access, and that access is public good for all. And lastly, as we know at Gallaudet, we have students who enter and often what happens to them, they thrive, tremendously so, because they can be fully engaged in the life of the community there. You know, many of you graduated from Gallaudet, and I think most of you, I think, have. I think there are some who are still working their way through or in graduate school, but what's interesting <coughs> is, you know, we continue the search, the search for that perfect world that is more broad than the one where we live. We seek to how we can have that same feeling of having full engagement in the broader world around us and not just within a localized community. Let us shift the conversation away from hearing loss to really understand the multilingual community that can thrive with us together. Think about the Spanish-speaking families 
the Arabic-speaking families, the German-speaking families, the French-speaking families, all of them coming together with us, thriving together in a multilingual community. How can we make that happen? These are the questions that we have to address over the next 27 years. These are our thoughts and considerations that should lead to action and leadership in the next 27 years. You know, we must rely on each other to come up with these solutions to improve the quality of lives for everyone post-ADA. Thank you for the invitation to be here today and to be part of this conversation. Thank you very much for coming. It's very fascinating to hear uh, about your contributions to the university uh, and to students and uh, about the challenges that you see that lie before us. Obviously, you were involved before the ADA passed, and uh, your perspective now on, on how things have changed and, uh, and where they're going is it was wonderful, so thank you. So we started this, present, this, this event with Congressman uh, Yoder, talking about legislation. We've had Tom, Congressman Takano talk about deaf interns and how they are helping the deaf communities that they serve. We've had the presidents of Gallaudet University talk to us about deaf education and the, the challenges that she's seen in her life and those that she sees set before us. And now I'd like to, uh, to wrap up the event. I'd like to uh, end with something that someone who has grown up um, w without knowing a time before the ADA, um, somebody who may have been, who were not, who was not used to the challenges of the past, and can now show us about his love for books and for language. So I'd like to invite August Kitama to the stage. Kitama, uh, a TEDx presenter, uh, to join us here. Hello, everyone. I uh, first want to uh, thank Dr. Hayden for hosting this wonderful event. Um, I also want to thank Representatives Yoder and Takano and President Cordano for guiding the way uh, for us to become uh, more equal and for a, a, a brighter future for the deaf community. I am honored to be among people who have been fighting uh, in this fight uh, for the deaf community uh, here in this room. Because of their persistence uh, and because of their passion, I am able to stand before you today. So I, I, you know, I have a dream to become uh, on the national stage just as you are, so I'm, I'm honored to be, to be among you. One thing that I um, think that I, uh, I'm honored to be here because this is the Library of Congress and I have a, a, a severe love for books. So before I get going, um, I'm going to ask the interpreter just to silence his, his voice for about 10 minutes. No, I'm just joking about not having an interpreter. <laughs> but let's take a moment to reflect about how it felt to watch me signing. To know what I wasn't saying, to, to not know what I was saying without the interpreter voicing for me. How did that feel? How did it feel to be left in the dark? I'm sure it was awkward, right? And then when you finally heard the interpreter's voice again, I'm sure you sighed a bit of a relief. There was a light that sort of went off in your head. And that is what I call the sort of agony and ecstasy of the human connection. We all want to feel a connection that's natural. But that connection is not something that we can always see or hear. It's something that we can feel. It's something that we feel in our heart. It's a moment of clarity. I, I discovered this when I was a wee lad learning how to read. Even though sign language is how I prefer to communicate, reading allows me to learn more about the world. There's a lot you can learn about the world just by hearing it somewhere. 
like on the radio when you're driving to work, or through the grapevine, which what I understand is a polite way of saying that you've been shamelessly eavesdropping. <laughs> I don't have that privilege to unconsciously absorb information without actively pursuing it. That's not a burden for me, it's actually a blessing. What wasn't handed to me, I've wanted for myself with a passion. And that passion started when I was in pre-kindergarten. We had a customary nap time, which was never my cup of tea. Luckily, one day my teacher told me that I didn't have to do nap time anymore. Instead, she took me into her office. She had piles of books, vocabulary cards, and colorful pictures of everyday things. But I didn't know the word for it. I felt like the cartoon man sketched above the word excited. I was right there in my teacher's office when I learned how to read. Learning to read was a fascinating process. Unless you know someone who is deaf, you've probably never considered how an audible language can be taught visually. It usually takes four steps. My teacher would show me a drawing of a hairy beast, and then letter by letter she spelt the corresponding word in English and ASL, and then showed the sign. So I made the connection between the written word, the picture, the finger spelling, and ultimately the sign. And now I knew that that hairy beast was a dog. That was essentially the foundation for my reading skills. But there's one crucial thing missing, my own voice. And what I mean by this is I was mechanically competent in writing, but it was too precise, devoid of any naturally occurring humanity that is so apparent in everyone's voice, both spoken and written. What I craved was to be able to express myself as authentically as possible through writing, which at that point was tricky seeing I couldn't hear organic conversations and imbibe that organically. Fortunately, I discovered a book of uh, children's stories called A Series of Unfortunate Events by Lemony Snicket's in the third grade. It was about the Baudelaire orphans. They lost their parents in a terrible fire, and now their new guardian, Count Olaf, is a vile egomaniac who lies to get whatever he wants including the orphan's enormous fortune. Snicket's writing style is quite distinctive. Which I would say means easily recognizable. Due to the author's affinity for humorously defining his large vocabulary in the middle of, this, of the story. For me, it was love at first word. Here was this book written for children that had words like penultimate, standoffish, words that you don't normally read. And his tone was interesting as well. It was very funny and familiar. It was something that I want. So, as I started to read more through the series, I had a new dimension added to my prism. One day, I saw the world through the eyes of a cynical New Yorker, David Sedaris, where a horrible incident could be recounted as a darkly funny anecdote. The next day, I'd see the world through Atticus Finch's eyes as a place to never lose hope when it comes to fighting the good fight. Eventually, my perspective became an amalgamation of the books I had read over the years. Reading the conversations in these books was where I found a natural rhythm. That rhythm fermented from reading the closed captioning on TV shows like 30 Rock and Seinfeld with the cascade of rapid fire wordplay. And that was the humanity I longed for in my writing. With a solid understanding of the art of conversation in English, I found my voice. Throughout this journey, I never stopped reading. I learned to read about the world. The value of reading comes from the power of information. I read to rid myself of ignorance. 
And I can tell you that when you read only 140 characters, that's not enough. I don't want to come across as an insufferable know-it-all, but just to show you how much I want to know. It's when people struggle to find meaning in life that I find meaning in the struggle. I have a purpose. It's why I get out of bed every morning lusting for novelty, where the adage goes, there's a whole world out there waiting for you. And I started exploring that world by remaining in one place with the greatest ticket ever, a book. In addition to following, falling in love with books, because of the strides we made in public education and civil rights, that disconnection from the world I felt as a deaf person is no longer tangible. To rest on our laurels and take all the progress we made in the last 20 years for granted wouldn't just be a disservice to the trailblazers, it'd be a disservice to our children and our children's children. I'm here because I know the world is bigger than this extraordinary nation. I'm here because I know we won't rest until we leave the world a better place than we found it. And all of this starts with a willingness to be a student for life. And we can do that just by opening a book and taking in that first sentence and keep reading. Thank you. Thank you, August, for your inspiring words. I know your passion for books very well, and uh, I'm amazed to have you here. Thank you to all of you who have come to participate in this event. Um, I hope that you've learned something about a new perspective and seeing people uh, who are deaf and signing present uh, here at the library. Uh, we do have events that uh, are ongoing. So it's nice to see a change uh, to have our, our regular language being replaced by American Sign Language. We are finished with the event now, but I will remind you that we have exhibits along the side of the room uh, from our collections. Everything uh, here on the tables is related to deaf history in the United States. Um, the contributions of deaf people uh, across our history and Gallaudet University. So you'll see some uh, old pictures, um, some letters from Helen Keller, um, and other such artifacts. So if you'd like um, uh, to uh, start uh, looking at the chronology of, of the collections we have. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.